Good afternoon, uh, welcome to the first interaction class uh, live session for programming in uh, C++. Uh, this is the first time uh, I am meeting you all uh, live and I would like to welcome you to the course. Uh, I hope uh, yeah, it has been uh, uh, going uh, well with the help of our uh, uh, teaching assistants and uh, the assignments are being done well and you are benefiting from the course. So, uh, we will in the next one hour uh, try to address a, a few queries which have been raised uh, through the Google uh, sheet. So, I have tried to uh, put the similar queries together and we will address them together. And uh, also we have picked up uh, some of the interesting and important questions from the forum. There have been some questions posted on the forum which either uh, could not be answered well or explained well or are interesting in by their nature. So, we will also like to um, address those, explain those. Uh, some of you have asked questions like uh, you know uh, what is a class or you know explain copy construct or these kind of which are basically mean that uh, I would need to go over what has already been discussed in the video and uh, there is in the presentation. So, those questions uh, will not be answered, uh, but because uh, it is really not possible to keep on again repeating what is there in the or it does not make sense either. This interaction session is particularly for all those uh, uh, issues which are specific. Uh, so, uh, if you have some specific questions, problems, uh, examples that uh, you are stuck with, uh, if you have already posted that will get discussed. If you have not, then uh, please post it on the chat. I have uh, uh, Srijani Majumdar, one of our TAs uh, helping me in this session. She will collate those questions and uh, after I have uh, finished with the questions we already have in the, uh, in, uh, in the discussion, I will try to address all of those questions. So, let us uh, get uh, started. Uh, the first question from Hars Mishra, uh, the question was class con concept as I explained naturally there has to be a specific one. So, I will skip. Uh, the second question Ankit Banerjee, if we can write the function definition within the class when then why do we write the function definition outside the class using the colon colon uh, operator uh, that basically is a class specification operator. The, there is no fundamental programming uh, uh, reason for this, it is primarily manageability and readability issues. If uh, the function uh, that uh, or the method that we are defining for a class as a body which is small, it is convenient to be able to write it within the class. But if it is a really long code, then uh, just think of it, if that code takes up a whole lot of space, then you lose track of what are the members uh, the class has in terms of the methods as well as data members and so on. So, it is just a readability manageability issue. So, you have to strike a proper balance in terms of what is uh, easy to do and what is more you know uh, manageable, more readable to do. Uh, moving to the third question, Ayush Rajput has asked this. In your video of uh, access specifier, there is a program 12.01 in which you have written void print const complex uh, ampersand t in the function declaration. I want to ask the purpose of writing const. I think this has uh, been explained uh, well as to why you use const, particularly when you use reference parameter. What has to be uh, noted uh, here, uh, Ayush, is this uh, complex uh, is uh, being used here as a reference parameter so that uh, the object does not need to be copied. So, if it is a reference parameter that means that if I make changes uh, to uh, this t in the function print, the formal parameter t in the function print, then whatever the actual parameter that has been passed in the place of t will also get changed. And that is uh, something which uh, we probably uh, we certainly do not want here because we just want to print. So, we want to use it as a read only object. So, the const here uh, helps that uh, purpose. It makes uh, sure that uh, with this const uh, before complex and ampersand, the print function will not be able to make any changes 
to t it will not be able to you know change any of its data member values and so on so that's the basic purpose so if your uh, parameter is passed by value if this one not there then you will not have the const that's a typical practice but uh, if you do have uh, a reference parameter then consider whether you would like to use the const because uh, if you are having a reference parameter and you want the parameter to be used only as a read only only as an input use the const if you are also want to use it uh, for outputting some results from the function then naturally we will not be using the const. So, that is the basic reason I think this is in other parts this has been uh, discussed, but uh, since you asked I just explained it more. So, moving on uh, uh, Raja Guru Nathan M has asked can you explain function pointers uh, Raja this is uh, again a very elementary question and it is a detailed discussion which is already there in the video and uh, I would uh, also uh, we have put uh, some uh, you know URLs where these concepts are explained pretty well uh, you are encouraged to look up uh, any uh, book on uh, say C programming to understand the concept of function pointers better. Uh, if you have some specific questions do ask them in the forum uh, and uh, but please remember that the good understanding of function pointers is very critical for following virtual functions in C++ which will come up in the second half of the course. So, please uh, uh, brush it up. Uh, moving on uh, this is from Sai Kumar Iyer. Uh, if we declare any variable globally then that variable can be passed in function or not yes it of course it can be passed I mean any global variable is available from the point it is uh, defined uh, uh, it is available for the rest of the program. So, any function which is which comes after that or if a variable is extant can make use of the variable in any possible way they make use of other automatic uh, variables in the code. So, if you um, uh, just uh, look at we have uh, uh, created two, two codes here on the left you can see here is uh, the global variable um, uh, which is x and here we are showing that there is a function which is a uh, print function which is using x and trying to print it this is one valid uh, use and uh, also we have uh, shown another uh, in terms of a function uh, show which is uh, to take an integer and uh, output that we are showing that you can pass x uh, to show as a parameter. So, all these uh, are uh, completely legal usage of any variable which is declared as global. Overloading uh, function and operator overloading I do not uh, there is no question here Milind Jain. So, what let us know what would you like to know about this concept be specific ask a particular problem. Uh, Shubhadi Patro asks what are the things which I should learn must in STL for competitive programming. Uh, well, if you are getting into competitive programming Shubhadeep then I would ask that uh, well it is not only STL you will have to learn the whole of C++ uh, with a better command, but STL is very very critical. So, um, uh, you must have a very good command over the containers and iterators uh, which are most required that is uh, the most used and most useful part of uh, STLs anyway. So, you should be able to you know uh, e use the different uh, data structures that are given as containers like array, vector, list, stack, queue, heap, map, set and all of that. Uh, I have given a um, URL where you will get details about each one of these uh, uh, templatized classes uh, of containers. In addition to that I will also advise that uh, try to develop good command over uh, these three components at least which is algorithm which is a collection of good uh, algorithms like uh, uh, sort uh, like binary search and so on because uh, they can be really useful in uh, writing uh, code which is very compact and uh, you know uh, very easy to write uh, uh, code which is uh, uh, which is short as well as will do the task uh, very fast. So, uh, understand the algorithms uh, well. Uh, streams are often uh, uh, very much required you you have you know see out see in 
but you want, if you want to do streaming in terms of uh, file and all that, you will uh, need to have a better understanding of the IO stream, use that uh, component of STL. And finally, there is a utilities component uh, which is uh, which has uh, a, a collection of very um, uh, you know small small uh, um, uh, classes and methods which are like it has a swap, it has a pairing, making pair and so on. So, that becomes uh, easy to develop uh, code for. STL has several other uh, components, I am not saying that you do not need to learn them, but uh, well at the uh, that since you had uh, specified that you must what you must learn, uh, these are in my view the must things that uh, you should have a command with. Uh, this question uh, came on the forum, uh, unfortunately I do not uh, have uh, the name of who posted this. A very interesting question, so I picked up. Uh, this is from uh, slide 22 of module 1 and uh, the, the person has uh, raised a very uh, uh, nice uh, point that uh, here a, a pointer is, is allocated, a pointer to integer, p is a pointer to integer and this is initialized with certain uh, hexadecimal data. And uh, then uh, we are using uh, a, another pointer q. Uh, which is a pointer to character and uh, over a sequence of print uh, uh, printf function, we are incrementing the pointer q one after the other. So, that will mean that it will first uh, look at the, the first address and try to print that whatever is there in the first address, then the second address and the third address and so on. So, uh, naturally the question uh, um, has been that uh, why the output is printed in the reverse order. So, if you now look into the output, this is this is the output that you get. So, you first uh, 2b is written then 1a then 7e then 8f. Naturally, the our intuition would say that it will start from here uh, 8f 7e like that. So, that is a question which is a very valid question. Uh, now, as it so happens that possibly the, this output we are showing is uh, usually a large number of machines are based on the x86 Intel architecture. In the Intel architecture, you will, you will understand since this is an integer value, this will have 4 bytes. So, the question is these 4 bytes, which order are they arranged? Are they arranged from the lower to the higher order or they are arranged from the higher to the lower order? So, the least significant byte, if that occurs at the lowest address, if the least significant byte, which is 2b here, if it occurs at the lowest address, which is where p is currently pointing to, initially pointing to, then we say that that style of storing data is said to be little endian. And there is another which is called big endian where you do the reverse. So, here is another example showing you that the least one comes to the first address, the next one comes to the next address and so on. So, you necessarily you uh, in, with little endian when you do this you necessarily go right to left. Whereas, big endian does just the opposite which is what we would intuitively think should happen that happens only with big endian architecture. So, you cannot uh, this we cannot control this uh, in terms of uh, whether it is little endian or big endian in terms of the programming language it is a feature of the uh, CPU architecture that you are using. A large majority of uh, processors uh, including the x86 are little endian. Uh, so, you, you will if you, if you want to use this kind of feature, it is better that you check out what is the endianness of your processor, which is very simple to do use you can use this kind of a code and you will immediately understand. Uh, moving on another question uh, uh, from the forum. Uh, which is uh, which again again I am sorry I do not have the name of the person posting uh, which says that on module 4 slide 5 in the sorting program uh, there is a data array which has uh, 5 elements, uh, but uh, when we refer to sort we say sort from data to data plus 5. Now, quite naturally that if uh, this is data which means that uh, in true terms this is data 0, then the uh, it's with 5 elements this last one should have been data 4. The question is why do you go up to 5 and uh, where you do not do data plus uh, 4. So, if you were programming in C I mean uh, usually you will do data plus 4. Now, here the reason is 
uh, the example uh, the illustration is using the sort function uh, I mean rather rather the, the sort uh, class instantiation in STL which uh, takes uh, a pair of what is known as iterators. So, it, it takes a, a pair of kind of pointers uh, where the first one where this pair of pointers first and last this is the first which is data for us this is the last which is data plus 5. Now, they define this range and you can see that the it is writing with the left side is a square bracket which means that whatever is on the first pointer is included whereas, the right side is an open interval it is a parenthesis only right parenthesis. So, it says that the last one is not included. So, if I pictureize it will look like this that this is your data 0, data 1, data 2, data 3, data 4. So, the sort has to take where it starts and has to get an position get an iterator which is one beyond the last one because the last is. Uh, so, if I give it data plus 5 then it will actually do it up to data plus 4 and that is the uh, convention of STL iterators. So, this uses a random uh, uh, iterator and that is the reason here it is not data plus 4 it has to be data plus 5 because the last uh, the closing position of the iterator is open and the position 1 before that is up to which the algorithm will apply. Okay. Now, so, let us uh, go to another question uh, uh, posting from the forum again a quote from uh, module 4 slide 7 uh, there is a searching uh, code given binary search and all that. So, it was uh, the task was to use the binary search uh, again algorithm from STL and uh, illustrate that how a key gets searched. So, the the binary search this uh, algorithm in STL actually uh, returns a bool. The return value the return value that you are getting here is actually a bool. So, if it finds uh, the data which is this one key in this iteration range which is data to data plus 5 you have already understood why it is data plus 5. If key occurs between them like 3 is occurring here then it will return a true otherwise if I give it say 7 it will return a false it is it is just like that. But it does not tell uh, what the question was uh, does not tell where exactly it, it occurs. Now, uh, binary search algorithm does not uh, say that in STL uh, because uh, there the, the deeper reason is uh, you will have to go a little bit more into STL to understand this is binary search is just taking two iterators and uh, it is not necessary that the underlying container has to be a linear container like an array or even a vector. The underlying container could be something else for example, the underlying container could be something like a you know binary search tree. So, it is the, the position as such in this case uh, would not uh, make uh, real sense and uh, um, that is the reason it just uh, tells you in boolean as to whether it found the element or it did not. If you want to get position in in, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, solving similar problems then you can use uh, the find algorithm from STD uh, from, uh, from the STL and there are a number of variants of find and uh, so you will get uh, the position or actually it will return you an iterator to the first uh, uh, occurrence of the element that you are trying to find. So, these two are little bit too differently modeled uh, uh, situations. So, binary search will just tell you whether it exists find will give you an iterated to the or rather I mean you can loosely think a pointer to the uh, location where the object actually occurs the, the key that you are looking for actually occurs. Again uh, I would like to emphasize the fact that unlike the way we write it in C where if you give 3 you would expect uh, uh, this is in uh, index position 2. So, you would have expect to get a result 2 saying you this is at the index position 2 find will not tell you that find would rather give you an iterator because again it will work not necessarily for 
strictly linear containers, the container could be non-linear and if it is non-linear then index really does not make sense. What makes sense is I have I'm, I can point to this uh, first occurrence element. Okay, ma, uh, so let us uh, okay <clears throat> again from the forum. It, this is a very important, interesting question. How does compiler know whether inline function is smaller or not? Now, whether it's smaller or not is is easy to determine because uh, the compiler is translating the function. So it uh, it can, uh, for example, it can count the number of bytes uh, in the binary translation and it will immediately know. But the key question is not only whether the function is smaller or not. The uh, what the compiler is trying to see is uh, by inlining this function whether it will benefit the execution, whether the execution will become faster. That is the sole point about uh, inlining. So, we can look at some of the factors which uh, the compiler has to look at. Uh, for example, if I inline, so the choice is between whether I inline or I keep it outlined. So, it, that, is, that, that is the kind of choice we are trying to make. So, there we will have to look at the cost. If we inline, then what is the savings that we get? And if we do not inline, then what are the uh, cost uh, that, that outline will have? Also, if I inline, on one side is the savings that I am making, on the other side there are some costs that I will incur also. So, let us look at those, I have written them down. For example, if I inline, then I, I may benefit on a number of costs. It is inline, so I will not, uh, the function call will not happen, which means that the activation record of the called function does not need to be uh, constructed, it does not need to be wrapped up. Uh, the two jumps to call the function and again to return from the function are not required. Uh, you may not need to, uh, you will not need to copy parameter uh, values and return values, which may or may not be a savings because a number of outline function also uh, passes parameters through register where you do not have this copy cost, but some will not. So, these are in terms of if I say the savings. Now, where uh, when you inline, then you expose a lot of issues as well. For example, uh, there are issues in terms of static data. If your function that you are intending to inline has a, uh, has a static uh, variable, uh, local static variable, then you will understand that if you inline it at three different places, you are you will potentially have three different static uh, variable declarations. So, that is kind of inconsistent with the concept of uh, the static. So, that is an issue. The major issue is the code will bloat because every time if the inline function is large, every time you are making a copy of that. So, your total program size which we say is the footprint of the program, the code size will increase. So, that is that is a major concern. Now, and um, also it will make the activation record of the calling function fatter because your inline function had a few say local variables. Now, when you inline it, the function you are trying to inline, if you inline it, the local variables that you had, those variables will need a place. So, they will now get the place, since you are not calling the function, there is no activation record of the called function. So, now they will get the place in the calling function, the parent function. So, the parent function's activation record is now getting bigger, right. So, that, those, that, those are, then it gets, it will potentially have lot more of swaps in and out, in and out, in and out. The function, suppose if the function is doing a uh, say a for loop within which the, the, the function that you wanted to inline is called. Now, you have replaced and that is a huge code. So, that is whole for loop code does not fit into the memory. So, every time you will keep on swapping. So, the benefits that you have earned by not uh, you know making jumps to the function dot doing the function call and functional wrap up protocol will quite a number of times get compensated by the cost that you pay for this code swapping. So, that is the reason that the, the delicate balance that the compiler has to do between as to what is uh, given a particular machine architecture, given a particular memory configuration, if possible, if it knows that, then it will try to make a balance as to what uh, should be in line and what should not be in line. And wherever it is, uh, thank you for raising this question. Uh, this is really an interesting insight that we I get an, got an opportunity to discuss. Uh, 
Uh, moving on, uh, well, this is a this is a question uh, which uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody keeps on asking at some point of time or other. Why can't we overload function on the basis of their return type? So, uh, I mean, one way, <laughs> I mean, a simple answer could be that C++ does not allow it. But uh, that's not what I want to tell you. I would like to show you that uh, well, if let's suppose that we were the designer of C++, so we allow it. So, let us say we have allowed that, that you can overload uh, in, in terms of uh, different return type. So, that will mean that uh, two such function signatures will be, will be permissible as valid overloads. You can see that uh, otherwise they are not because they have the same uh, name naturally and they have the same single parameter type. But we are saying that they are the overload is resolved in terms of the return type. So, I have given two different return types. Okay. So, these are let us assume that this is allowed. So, there are two overloads one and over one and two. Now, in this context uh, let us see let us look at uh, three calls of this function. Suppose, I call the function like this int i initialized with the return value of my function int. I mean this this should not be int this this should be some some int variable let us say int variable x int variable x. So, you can say this is int x is a variable and it is it is passing on that. Well, now when that happens then you can see that uh, the input uh, parameter is an integer and the output parameter is expected to be an int also. So, we can say well in this case we can say this is overload 1 because if it were overload 2 then my this part will compute a double which cannot be used to initialize on the int. Right. Now, what happens here? This is x. What happens here? Now, this is returning some type of value. It could return the overloads, it could return int, it could return double. If it returns double, it is there is no issue, but if it returns int also then by the fact that int can be implicitly cast on to double, this will also be valid this will also be valid. So, according to our basic rules of uh, implicit casting in this case both of my overloads are valid calls. So, what would the compiler do? How will the compiler decide which overload is to be used? Third case even worse is when you call the function you call my function and you are not using the return type you are C, C++ allows you to do that. It is not necessary that you will have to use the return type. How will the compiler know whether you are intending to use overload 1 or you are doing the overload 2? Does not know that. So, it is not uh, the C++ cannot um, uh, allow uh, overload resolution by return type because it is not logically consistent to do so. So, it cannot be done. Uh, okay. Mm, uh, this was another which uh, came on the forum. This is regarding initializing uh, data members uh, within the constructor. So, there are two uh, cases shown. So, there are two data members. These are otherwise these classes are otherwise identical. So, these two data members. So, there is a cons constructor of this complex class and uh, in this case what we do we get into the body of the constructor and then we initiate then we assign the constructor parameter value we use constructor parameter value to set the value of the data member whereas here we are using the proper initialization list and we are using the parameter re to set initialize the parameter re underscore the data member re underscore the question is what is the difference? Now, what happens is the right one is actually the correct initialization process because if you if you recall uh, we have at different places mentioned that when the constructor is about to start executing its body at that time the object has already been constructed because the body of the constructor is expected to do some additional tasks which you may want to do at the time of constructing the object, but the actual object construction which is initializing all the variables properly is already achieved when the 
control reaches the opening curly breasts of the constructor function. So, the object is already constructed here. So, if I put it in the initialization list then I have properly initialized. If I do not have it here like here, so what is happening? The compiler has no does you have not uh, told the compiler as to how to initialize these uh, data members, but it has to initialize them so that it the object construction can be complete. So, it uses some garbage values. So, here the initialization will happen once here with a garbage and then what is you are doing here is not initialization this is an assignment. So, you are making a fresh assignment with the variables here. So, this is always a preferred way of uh, going and this is what I would not recommend you to do. Well, uh, having said that I would also like to point out let us uh, suppose that uh, well in this case you could do either the, the, the one over here the left one or uh, you could either do the left one or you could uh, do the right one. But suppose one of these a, you have a data member which is const. If it is const then it will necessarily have to be initialized to the initialization list because as I have explained this is a point where the object has already been constructed and within the body of the constructor you are actually making an assignment to the data member. And if that data member happens to be a constant it means that it you cannot make changes to it. So, it means that you cannot make assignments to it. So, it is not possible it will not even be possible to write the, the code on the left hand side it will only have to use the code on the right hand side. So, that is the proper way to initialize in every case. Uh, another this uh, question uh, I, I think uh, this uh, person Monoj had uh, sent me a mail with this question possibly uh, I picked it up because it was interesting. So, just uh, have a quick look there is a class A which has one uh, public uh, data member of type int and then class B and class C are uh, uh, virtually inheriting from that and then class D. So, this kind of a he, he is kind of trying to make a kind of a diagram you know diamond uh, diagram. So, then there is a class D which is uh, multiply inherited from B and C. So, that is quite understandable. Now, the basic question is is trying to estimate what is the value of uh, the uh, what is the size of a D class object and uh, the question was why is it uh, 24 bytes. So, uh, there are two things uh, that we will have to see as to what are the things uh, that uh, will uh, go into the size of uh, uh, a object of D or OBJ in this case is obviously at the base this is there the int uh, a is there. So, uh, if we if we say that uh, int int has a size 4 and if we say that uh, the pointer has a size uh, uh, 4 uh, as well. So, um, uh, if we have that then uh, um, uh, what should be what should be the size. So, the size uh, should be I have 4 here. Now, the object obj of class D will have 2 base classes because B and C both are taken and what are these base classes? They are derived from A. So, I have 1 int coming from B and I have 1 int coming from A. So, I have these uh, uh, I will uh, have these 4 and 4 uh, uh, coming in. In, in terms of this inheritance. Now, to take care of that what he is intelligently done? He has done a virtual this is virtual. So, which means that even though two instances of this want to come in because of multiple inheritance one instance there will only be one instance because he is using a virtual inheritance. So, 4 bytes come from this integer. Now, what else do I need in D? There are two parent uh, um, uh, classes by inheritance. So, we will need the pointers to these parent classes because otherwise in the whole object layout you will not be able to see where is your parent class uh, B and where is your parent class C. So, I need two pointers. So, 4 from the int and 4 each from the pointer. So, this will take 12 provided 
int has a size 4 and pointer has a size 4. Now, let us see if uh, what happens uh, if the int uh, still has a size 4, but the pointer has size 8, int is pointer is size 8. Now, the question is what should why should that uh, say so by the same logic it should have been 4 plus 8 plus 8 it should have been 20 16 plus 4 20, but it, why is it 24 to understand that uh, I have actually changed this code to you know explicitly output all the different size and if you look at uh, this is this is where I am showing this size of int is 4 size of uh, pointer is 8 size of a is 4 which is correct, but look at size of b. What is the size of b class object? You would expect it to be 4 from the int in the class a plus 8 because you need a pointer to that. You would have expected it to 12, but this turns out to be 16. The reason for that uh, has to do with uh, the alignment of addresses. So, if I have a a field which is 8 bytes in size, then the address to which it can happen can only be will always have to be divisible by 8. This is called the address alignment rule. I am not in a position to explain this in detail because this needs a uh, deeper understanding of the uh, computer architecture as to why it is done that way, but please keep in mind that if a field has a certain size say the size is 8, say uh, 4 or the size is 8, then the address where it can be located has to be divisible by that size. So, if I if I think of that I have an int, so how will how will a b object look like? It will have an int and it will have a void star. Now, if I start from 0, then this should have started at 4 because int is of size 4 and it would have ended by 12, but this is not what will happen because void star or the, the pointer type has a size 8 and its address is turning out to be 4 which is not acceptable, it, 4 is not divisible by 8. So, what will happen is interestingly it will lay it out like this that it will have an int which will go from 0 to 3. From 4 to 7 actually there will be a free space and then from 8 to 15 that is total 16 bytes you will have the pointer. Now, the starting address of the pointer is 8 which is divisible by 8. So, this is the basic reason as to why it happens that way. So, once you understand that you will you, you will you will understand that uh, our original computation uh, would have shown 4 plus 8 plus 8 which is 20, but 20 is not divisible by 8. So, it will have to be the next number which is 24. So, it is 4 bytes of integer plus uh, 4 bytes of open space it's kind of unused space then 8 bytes then 8 bytes brings up to the total of 24. And that is the basic reason why the size is here. It is a very interesting question asked and uh, please uh, go through this recording later on also if you have not understood the whole point uh, right here. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Manoj uh, which is again in uh, terms of uh, object construction. So, um, uh, there is a class A and uh, there is a class B uh, which is derived from A. And he is uh, uh, saying that uh, he is trying to do uh, certain things that uh, he is trying to do three things. One is uh, he is doing b star obj or he is doing uh, new b or he is doing b obj. His question is that uh, when he does either of this then um, uh, he actually the constructor of a gets called and then the constructor of b gets called, but when he does this then no constructor is called. So, when I create object of class b as above then the constructor of class a is called there is a first question. Second is, but when I create object of class b like b star obj then the constructor of class a is not called. 
The question is actually not that, that if you do this, the fact is not limited to the, the fact that uh, constructor of class A is not called, actually neither the constructor of class A nor the constructor of class B is called. So, to understand this better, I have just uh, extended this code, I have uh, put in messages which uh, say when the constructor is called, when the destructor is called for both these classes. I have also introduced a global variable, the purpose of this global variable is to just keep track of how many objects are you constructing. So, every time you construct an object, you basically increment this number, so that we can track which object is talking about which one. And in class B, I have introduced a kind of an identifier, I have kind of uh, put a uh, data member where I can pass and put a number. So, with that when I try to do this, if I do this B star P O B J, then actually, so this is this output that I am getting, I am just showing the output here. So, there is no output corresponding to this, we will explain why. Now, when I do B O B J 1, so this 1 goes as parameter to the constructor of class B and that initializes this uh, value in class B and I get this output constructor of A OBJ constructor of A object and called with the value i which is the current value of count because this is the 0th object being constructed and then the constructor of B is called where I print that the value that had passed. The, the reason for this is and we have explained this uh, in terms of inheritance that when you have derived classes, then a derived class the construction of a derived class can start because derived class is deriving all the data members from the parent. So, obviously, I cannot construct a derived class object unless the derived the parent class the base class has been constructed. because where will be the data members that are defined in the base class if I do not construct that. So, if every time I want to construct a, an object B, it will have to first call the constructor of A the base class and only after that only after that construction is over which is here, only then the constructor of class B can be called. So, if you have a hierarchy then in this way, if, if A again had, had a, another parent class say another parent class C. Then if I want to construct a an object of class B, it has to construct an object of class A which has a parent class C. So, it has to construct an object of class C and the construction will have to start from there. So, that is the basic reason why that answers the uh, one part of the question then why the constructor of class A is called. So, whenever you construct an object that will happen. So, this, uh, this is the output corresponding to this uh, uh, object uh, definition. Then I construct uh, another by using by using the uh, dynamic uh, allocation uh, that is by new. Again, I have a similar construction. You can see that I am just keeping track of which object number by this uh, count, so you can easily understand. And we have passed one in the first place. See, so, this is just to show that these are their identities. Now, what happens when you do this? This is a pointer. So, what is P O B J? P O B J is not actually an object, it is a pointer that you are creating for an object. Now, till you have done an actual dynamic allocation and you have actually constructed object at the runtime, P O B J is P O B J for that time say initially what happens is P O B J is has a question mark it is there is no object that it is pointing to there is nothing to get con, nothing to construct here. So, there is no B object that it actually is pointing to till you explicitly construct one through this new operator. So, naturally when you come across B star P O B J there is no construction that has to happen because it is only the construction of a pointer object and pointer as you know is a built in data type it does not have a separate constructor and no B object are to be constructed here. And that is the reason when he is trying to create uh, uh, trying to write something like B star OBJ then the constructor of A or constructor of B 
are not called because there is no construction happening at all. The construction will happen only when it comes across here where you do the new. Uh, just to though it was not there in the part of the question just to uh, end I have also shown what will happen when you wrap up. So, when you delete. So, the objects have been constructed in this order uh, the this is the first the 0 th object this is the first object. So, when you wrap up when you delete this naturally the uh, in terms of uh, deletion the constructor of A was called first and then that of B, but at the destruction it will happen in the reverse order. Please remember this first the destructor of B will happen and then the destructor of A will get called. It will always happen in the exactly the reverse order because you have an inheritance from A to B. So, you may be changing you may be in B you may be referring things to A. So, I cannot wrap up A first I have to wrap up B first which is the child class child class part uh, of the object and then only I can uh, wrap up the parent class part of the object. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, this is a little bit involved example, but uh, uh, this was from uh, Krishna Krishna Kant uh, in uh, terms of uh, uh, you know assignment one. I think uh, the basic reason the question here was that if uh, I use float, which is say four bytes, then uh, this union shows uh, uh, twenty, which is right because you know int is four, let's say, and this is four, and uh, unsigned carry is one, so this is twenty. And uh, this is the union, so the maximum of that fields will exist. So this answer is 20, which is he is happy with that. But uh, when I instead, if I if I use uh, say double, which has size 8, so this is 4, this is 8, and uh, this is 4, this is 8, and this again is 20. Then again, I expect the answer to be 20 because. Uh, 20 is the maximum, but the answer turns out to be if you do the uh, print the size of you will actually get it to be 24. The reason again is simple you will understand from our earlier discussion on alignment of addresses that uh, int is size 4. So, it needs an address which is divisible by 4, double is size 8 needs an address which is divisible by 8, unsigned char is 1. So, it needs an address which is divisible by 1 which means that any address will work. So, naturally I need out of these even though I have just 20 bytes, but I need an address which will be divisible by 8 because in though in those allocated bytes the union may have actually kept a double number and a double data cannot be put in an address which is not divisible by 8. So, 20 will not work I have to go to the next multiple of uh, 8 which is 24 it so happens that that also is a multiple of 4 and 1. So, 24 is the answer. So, that is the reason the alignment is the reason that this shows it as a uh, as 24 if the size of uh, double is 8. Couple of other questions how to improve programming skills uh, Onkar uh, Modukar Kanade Sanup Sharma it is through practice just I you know solve more and more problems. Uh, use uh, the there are several sites in the net like uh, you know stack overflow the code guru lot of that you just uh, try to read as much of code as you can try to uh, write those uh, programs similarly in your own way that there is no other way to improve programming skill than practicing practicing and practicing, but do try to read good code as well. Uh, basic examples to follow your ideas uh, Kevin I am sorry I would have preferred to uh, give more examples, but then the whole of at least a major part of C++ needed to be covered in uh, 40 modules 20 hours and this is I mean you have seen that uh, even then we have exceeded the time at uh, some places. So, there is no scope to give uh, um, uh, more examples uh, here. But if there are certain areas where you are facing difficulties to understand please raise as to what is your difficulty we would like to give you more examples on that. Can, can you please provide uh, the written provide the written in detail notes of C++ uh, there is no detail notes uh, the PowerPoint presentations uh, have been shared. Uh, so, use them as notes um, uh, we are working on creating the transcript of the whole uh, video presentations uh, I'm, I hope it will be available in the next session. 
state concept which slowly to better understand again it's a it's a matter of uh, you know running against time so um, uh, i would have preferred to go slower but then uh, this is the best that we have and please uh, let us uh, know if you um, have certain areas where you can explain more we would like to do that uh, moving on how can i get started with competitive programming c plus is c plus plus most suitable c plus plus is accepted uh, in all competition it provides you a very good balance between speed uh, using uh, built in uh, uh, functions uh, from stl and so on so different algorithm takes a uh, little time if you uh, use uh, stl well so well it can uh, i would recommend uh, that you can use this uh, provided you have uh, mastered it well suppose you want to make a library management system in c++ uh, shubhadeep uh, um, again this is again your question but i do not think this is exactly in the in the scope because this is more about how do you design a software system and has to do more with the object oriented analysis design but at a, at a top level i would say that first uh, design the architecture in uml and then expand the components with proper class and interaction diagram so you'll be able to see that areas where things are very dense that they are interacting too much between themselves so that development should go to one person and another another bunch of you know classes which are interacting a lot should go to another person so that in between them the dependence should be minimized uh, but it's it's more a software engineering uh, question uh, so we have no scope of uh, explaining it uh, further and uh, your yes, next question is also related to this whether it'll start from scratch that's not the idea of intelligent software development you must uh, reuse as much as you can uh what made you to come to this excellent position uh, devashmita pal uh, i did not understand the question uh, so you can uh, post it again or mail me as to what you wanted to mean i'll try to address to which language shall i go either c++ or java or why so c++ is highly recommended uh, i'm mean, uh, you know this is not a question of whether i use this language or i use that language the question is what is the task at hand every task has a language which is more suitable to that you can write any program in any language but languages are designed based on the type of task so if you are writing serious system uh, kind of software you will obviously use c++ for transactional applications financial applications java has to be preferred for engineering problem solving python has a much better edge c is good for embedded systems and so on uh, but having said that uh, c++ uh, in the recent times uh we are we are uh, using uh, our discussions based on an older uh, standard uh, called uh, c++ uh, it's kind of uh, uh, really eridine standard which has been extended later on in 2005 2009 uh, but we haven't gone beyond that there have been major uh, advances in terms of c++ being used as a multi paradigm language in c++ 11 and c++ 14 so if you are interested you can try to pick those up uh whom i am talking to prabhash uh, meharia prabhash you can uh, pick those up and uh, you will see that even uh, many of the applications that are typically written in other languages like in java or in python may be written in a more compact and more efficient manner in c++ 11 or 14 uh the question paper pattern lakshman rao kalluri the pattern will be similar to assignments so quiz and programming that you are solving they are in the same pattern programming concept i need clearly sir well keep on watching the video and practice more jay surya there is no other uh, way you can uh, get there uh, what is the difference between c language and c++ i think at the very beginning in week 1 itself uh, this has been discussed uh, shangita so if primarily the difference is c is a procedural language and c++ is procedural plus object oriented but there is i mean if you if you go through week 1 you'll find that c++ also has certain parts which are not necessarily object oriented but that's what i called better c part of c++ so uh, there are several differences uh, between them but the whole of uh, c is a subset of c++ so uh, it's uh, uh it's not right to say that what is the difference in terms of these languages is better to say that what is extra in c++ and that's primarily object orientation template and the multi paradigm features how do i apply logic in programming and uh, dynamic uh, memory allocation rashi uh, i'm not sure what you're asking for but uh, from these terms i can understand that you need to go back to the video and study again and ask specific questions
After the completion of uh, this course, what project can we do to enhance our GitHub profile? Uh, Vishesh Kothari, is it uh, the enhancing your GitHub profile? Is it uh, the reason you are doing this course? I am sorry. Uh, then, well, you may not be at, at, the, at the best place because here we are trying to understand uh, the C++ language and programming and uh, you know profile can be enhanced in with we, I mean to enhance the profile you need a whole lot of different things. Uh, but uh, certainly only one advice I can give you that uh, your profile will possibly get enhanced if you do projects for which there are customers. So, identify them and try to address those. Which language is the future of the uh, coding languages? Because uh, I mean the, the future of the coding languages will come in future. I mean who, who has seen the future? If you talk about uh, how the current uh, languages are doing, there are several you know ranking indexes which are done by popularity of the language or in terms of you know expert opinion on the language TOB is a popularity index where Java is at the top uh, and uh, C and C++ uh, are the other two in top three Python is on fourth. But uh, IEEE's uh, expert index actually puts Python as a first topmost language now followed by C++ Java and then C. So, if you are a language enthusiast I would say that learn all these four languages and along with it learn how to program in uh, x86 assembly that will really help you in language understanding. Uh, Ravi Prabhat Singh, you have a long question, sir, after completing the course problem solving through programming in C, I have taken to this course, find it difficult, I have to complete this course anyhow. Uh, please suggest any extra material or supplementary way for better understanding of this course. Uh, Sib, uh, you will have to watch the videos uh, more regularly, uh, but as I uh, responded earlier that uh, one of the best ways to learn is to practice more. So, please go to uh, some of the very standard code practice sites like Stack Overflow, Code uh, Guru and so on. Pick up projects, try to read, understand those, uh, try to write them in, in your way and that would be the best way to learn. Because if you have done uh, programming in, in C, then you are already ahead of many others. So, have confidence on yourself. If you keep on with it, very soon Ravi, you will be able to uh, attain the mastery in this course. Can we develop an app using C++ uh, beneath Fed D? Yes, the answer is yes, of course you can. Uh, what would you suggest for a person having no prior knowledge about programming? Uh, that is uh, Sonup Sharma. If you want to get started on programming, my suggestion always is to start with Python. It is the simplest language to learn. It is a beautiful language, it has a very beautiful free resources available, excellent tutorial and uh, then try to learn by practicing coding, understand, try to focus on the very basics clearly. Once uh, you have uh, learnt uh, Python uh, to, a, to a reasonable extent, then you can move on to other languages, you will find that handling of other languages gets easier. Uh, Ayush Rajput suggests me the best compiler for C++, I do not know what is called a best compiler. A compiler is a compiler is a compiler, it has to compile correct, there is no best or better compiler. Uh, of course, there are uh, compilers which are more used, GCC is certainly probably the most widely used compiler for C++. Can you please suggest me a book which contain only problems and exercises to practice uh, Rohit Lingala? Uh, they, these are these are books which we recommend. Strauss Troop's book is known. Uh, Lipman, Scott Myers, all these are books which have uh, problems and exercises, but not only problems and exercises. I mean, if you can, if you uh, happen to find one, please send me the link. I would like to use that for setting future assignments from that. The examination will be paper and pen on online computer based test. Uh, it is an online test as you know Sai Mohan. Again, again these are questions which are administrative, we should not uh, ask them in the in the technical session. Uh, Ifat Naz, he is a great professor. Thank you Ifat. Devashmi Tapal, what made you to come up to this excellent position? Again the question, I, 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 as I said I am not understanding this, uh, this question. If you explain uh, me more then I can try to, I think that is all right. Uh, um, so, we will just uh, move on, I will I am checking with uh, Srijani whether there are some more uh, qu questions of unique kind which is uh, 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 which I can address uh, the question, uh, who is asking this? Uh, can I go and learn blockchain technology after this course? There is there's no nothing common between C++ programming and blockchain, I mean you can learn anything, you can learn. Uh, 
uh, any any kind of uh, technologies before and after this there is no dependence blockchain is a is a very different kind of uh, architectural concept on uh, collaboration uh, sharing uh, kind so you can certainly do that but it's got no dependence with this course uh, Tusha Sharma is asking uh, how to get scholarship from NPTEL exams. So, you will have to write to the NPTEL office. I mean, we do not administer uh, anything in this uh, NPTEL program, we are just you know technical uh, persons. Uh, Ravi Prabhat, this session is uh, really very knowledgeable. Thank you, Ravi. I will, I will really feel that uh, all our effort, the effort of the TAs and uh, mine are, uh, are rightly awarded if uh, you all you know find the course useful and learn C++ and make your career uh, advance based on this. So, certainly all the best for that. Uh, that is all I think there were several other questions, but which have uh, already got uh, answered in terms of the presentation and we are we have already exceeded the time by 6 minutes I am sorry about that, but needed to be answered. So, thank you all uh, very much uh, for um, uh, attending this session and uh, for uh, pursuing this course in programming in C++. So, this uh, uh, deliberations were primarily aligned with completion of 4 weeks uh, of the course. We will do another live session at the end of the course when you have seen all the modules and you will have certainly more involved questions plus, but please uh, give us questions which are specific which are not directly answered in the video. So, that we can spend the time in a more effective way and everyone else can benefit from that. Thank you all very much, have a very nice uh, evening and uh, keep on enjoying the assignments and the videos. Thank you.